What's up guys? It's Frozen Electronics. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Frozen Electronics. Today is going to be a follow-up on my last video about the little uh, DG200BP vintage IC that I have. Um, there was a request by my, one of my viewers, Quantum Fluxible, uh, and others who wanted a follow-up to see the switching time. Quantum Fluxible in particular said I should upload videos more often, so I'm going to try. Again, um, I'm having overheating problems probably because it's the summer here in Canada and it's uh, quite warm uh, and of course with my equipment on and my monitors on my room gets warmer than the rest of the house. The last video I rendered I actually had to open the sides of my computer and have a fan blowing in on it uh, and this is with quite a good heatsink. I bought quite a good one. It has two fans, one on either side. It's one of the vertical mount heatsinks. Anyway, that's besides the point. So the plan is today is I'm going to generate a few different signals. I'm going to start with a pulse width modulated signal which is going to be um, generated by my bus pirate. We're going to take a look at that switching signal. We're going to see how fast the rise time is. Once we know that, then we're going to take a look at um, both before and after it's been through the chip to see how quickly it reacts to a, a signal telling it to turn on, uh, which will be interesting. So, we are going to uh, set it all up. We're going to be using, uh, of course, my, um, my HP 54645D oscilloscope, but we're also going to be using uh, a scope I don't use very much because it's not particularly a great scope, my Handtech uh, 6022BE. However, there's a guy on the EEV blog forum, uh, he goes by username Richard K, and he's actually created his own software for this um, USB scope using the SDK that Handtech provides, which is amazing. It must have been a crap ton of work because I can imagine their SDK is probably hard to understand, the documentation is probably awful, probably took him a while to do it. And he's implemented a whole bunch of features that are absolutely great, make the working with the software a lot easier, and actually gives a bit more value to this scope, I think. Um, and so it seems he hasn't done any updates in a while, but I've downloaded the most recent version of his binary, which is version 1.0 beta PR17. So uh, we're going to be using that version. Um, but that's only later on when we need to compare them side by side, because sadly, channel 2 on my scope is not working. Uh, and in order to fix it, I uh, it's a long story. But anyway, let's get into it. Let's take a look at the signal coming from the bus pirate. Just a quick aside, for those of you that don't know, or who haven't used a bus pirate, this is the bus pirate interface. You open up a serial port. Um, I use Realterm. I find it's the best uh, serial program available for Windows. And this is your main menu that you get. Uh, when you first plug it in, you have to type a question mark, and then you get this menu. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using this command, generate PWM, uh, which is a lowercase g. And then it can also um, control servos, which is kind of cool, uh, using the s command. That just generates a uh, variable PWM depending on the commands you give it. But anyway, for now, what we're going to do is we're going to type in g. Oh, well, that's right, we have to be in a mode, which is kind of stupid. Uh, so we just pick any mode, it doesn't matter. I'll pick one wire. So, we can choose between 1 to 4 megahertz uh, for the PWM. So, I think we're going to start with 1 kilohertz. And we'll have a duty cycle of... Yeah, we'll start with 50%, maybe later we'll change it. So now that the PWM is active on the auxiliary pin, which is the blue line on the bus pirate uh, ribbon cable, we're going to be seeing a 50% PWM signal. It's just basically a 1 kilohertz square wave. Uh, that's basically it. So let's go take a look. Okay, so uh, this is my 54645. For those of you that have, have or haven't seen it before, great oscilloscope made by HP in the 90s. Um, it has 16 channel digital and two analog channels. Unfortunately, uh, ch channel A2 is not working, so I can't do any of the math functions and stuff, which sucks. But here's our uh, square wave that we're getting out. 
Uh, as you can see, we're at one volt per division, so we're getting a peak to peak, well, let's actually measure it. Peak to peak of 3.4 volts, uh, which is good. And uh, as far as the frequency, we should be getting exactly one kilohertz. It's telling us 1.008. Duty cycle of 48.4%, although we'll actually zoom in a little bit, get a bit more accurate. So yeah, 1.008 and duty cycle of 48.4, which is good enough. Now, what we're really interested in is the rise time. See how quickly this is rising. So we have to get in quite close on one of the edges. So we're down at two microseconds per division. Let's get even closer. 500 nanoseconds, we're down to 100 nanoseconds. So it's telling us our rise time is um, between 23.5 and 24.5 nanoseconds which is pretty good. If you look at that close up, that's actually a pretty good clean um, rise there. You can see that, I'm pretty sure it comes through while on camera. Uh, so that's pretty good. So that's one of the edges. So 23 to 24 nanoseconds. Um, did I just say that right? Yes, 23 nanoseconds. So now let's look at the fall time. So we're gonna clear that measurement. We're gonna zoom out. Let's change our edge to falling. Zoom back in, and we'll take fall time measurement. Wow, so that fall time, 10.5 nanoseconds, which is interesting. We can actually change our thresholds. Uh, that's at 1090. If we're taking a 2080, uh, then it's actually 6.8 nanoseconds. Um, I don't understand what the voltage, oh, we can actually tell it what the voltages are, that's kind of cool. I believe that 1090 is the standard for fall times. Um, so that's 10.5 and then at uh, 2080 we're getting 6.8. So let's actually take another quick look at the rise time using both of those. So back to fall. rising edge, zoom in, time, rise time, threshold. So at 2080 it's 8 point, well between 8, well, let's zoom in a bit further, Yeah, 8.1, 8.3 nanoseconds at 1090, saying 22.7. Now that makes a big difference because as you can see, there's that little kink at the end there, which is making all the difference in that measurement. But anyway, these are pretty good rise and fall times for a square wave, especially generated by our little bus pirate. Okay, so just as before, I've got the frozen split supply here. We've got 16 volts coming in, so we've got plus and minus eight and ground in the center. I've got the chip powered from that. We've got the one kilohertz square wave going into the switch control for uh, switch two. Then for the input signal, I've just made a resistor divider over here, so we're just getting in a solid four volts uh, input. The output is going currently to the HP scope, and so we'll take a look at uh, switching the four volt signal on and off at one kilohertz. So as you can see, we're getting kind of a strange waveform out. The on is very fast uh, when it switches on. Uh, it's very good. The only problem is uh, we're getting these spikes that go down below ground. Um, some of them as far as uh, like minus you know, three to four, five volts, uh, which is kind of strange. And we're getting that positive little spike as well. And then of course, the shut off is, um, mm, I would say, kind of crap. <laughs> so it could be that one kilohertz is too fast for this um, chip, which is unfortunate because that's the slowest I can go with the bus pirate. So I guess we're gonna have to come up with another way to create a square wave. But before we do that, let's take a look at them side by side. As I mentioned before, I'm using the Open6022 software by Richard K from the forum. Uh, channel 1 is the input signal from the bus pirate, and channel 2 is what we're getting out from the switch. Um, interestingly, I forgot that it's inverted, uh, that when you give a low signal to the switch, that is turning it on, and that a high switch turns it off. Uh, that's because of that, uh, the way the drive circuit works. If you go back to the schematic diagram of the actual switch on the output, 
um, it makes sense when you look at the way they have everything set up. Uh, the only thing uh, I might be able to do here is to change the... Uh, no, even changing the uh, duty cycle won't help. I really need to just slow down the uh, one kilohertz wave. So we're going to have to try and find a way to do that because we want to get a nice clean switching signal if we can to see the maximum frequency this thing can handle. Alright, well the easiest way I know how to get a simple square wave is the cheap and easy way using a red board, which is just an Arduino. Um, I was going to actually throw an Atmega on the breadboard with it, but then I just said, ah, bugger it, I'll just whip out the Arduino. As I've mentioned before, I'm not a huge fan of Arduino, but they can come in handy for quick prototyping stuff like this, which is why I do appreciate them. Uh, so the average output uh, when you do an analog write, which I think is a very misleading function name, and I don't like that Arduino uses that, because it's not actually an analog write, it's just PWM. Anyway, so this top waveform is an analog write on pin 9 with a 50% duty cycle. And we're actually going to quickly uh, measure that, if I can remember how to do it. So, as we're seeing down in the corner there, I hope you guys can read that, we're getting about 490 hertz, which is what the Arduino website should be, the PWM frequency. And as you can see, the switching waveform is still kind of screwed. When it turns off, we get this slow... Uh, fade. So obviously there's some capacitance going on there somehow. Um, I guess there's some parasitic capacitance on the output of that pin or something. Uh, but I'm going to try and slow things down even more in a minute here. What I'm interested in is on channel 2, I want to see what the negative overshoot is. So it's getting an undershoot from anywhere from 25 30% all the way down to 13%, 12% sometimes. So that spike on the bottom there is quite uh, big because it's actually going down into the negative free, uh, negative voltages. If I actually get, um, let's see, the minimum in volts and the peak to peak. So our minimum, yeah, we're getting all the way down to minus 2.6. So yeah, that seems about right to me. So going from ground, which is zero, and then the cursor goes up, yeah, to four volts. So our actual signal is still there at four volts. It's just all these spikes down here are increasing our peak to peak. If we look at our RMS value, that would be a bit interesting. Yeah, about 3.1617. Um, there's a lot of interesting measurements on this that I don't think... Oh, we can even just do it on the visible capture. Now that's interesting. Now it's showing our negative overshoot a 60% almost, which actually makes more sense when you look at the size of the spikes. Interesting, I'm starting to really like this software. I highly recommend you guys check it out if you have one of these oscilloscopes. So now let's try and slow down that switching waveform even more if we can. So just as I was about to set up my DAC uh, with an Arduino sketch that I had written before, I remembered the tone function. Um, which makes things very easy because you can actually specify the frequency you want. So I have it set up to give us 200 hertz, 100 hertz, 50 hertz, and 31 hertz in a loop. Each of those for 3000 milliseconds or 3 seconds. So we can take a look at how it responds to each frequency. So uh, let's upload this and take a look at how it reacts. Okay, so there's 200 hertz, 100 hertz, 50 hertz, and 31 hertz and as you can see on each of them we're still getting that slope so that turn off time seems to be the same no matter what the frequency is but before I think we were going so fast we were interrupting that before it could actually get down to nothing so that's kind of interesting okay well I've changed the code so that all we have is 50 hertz now uh, I'm trying to get a good look at the rise time uh, on channels 1 and 2, let me take a look at it. Um, and it seems the software isn't particularly good at that. Um, but as you can see, I just want to measure quickly this length of time. So it takes it about 2 milliseconds from the time it switches off to get back down to 0 volts. Um, as you can see, this is sort of shifting a little bit but it's pretty stable. So that turnoff time is about two milliseconds no matter what. 
which as you can see here means that a frequency higher than about 500 Hertz is going to interrupt that turn off time uh, which is probably why we were getting all those peaks. Now if we actually zoom out a little bit Oh yeah, we are still getting some of those peaks at the bottom, but that's only when it switches on. Hmm, interesting. Uh, but now let's take a better look at this, uh, the second waveform here on my good oscilloscope, the HP. Now interestingly on this scope, which has a better sample rate and uh, better bandwidth, better everything basically, we can see this kind of weird squiggling action going on at the bottom there. Um, interestingly, uh, this is a 50 hertz square wave, so that wiggling down there is actually quite slow, uh, a couple hertz. Uh, I'm not sure where that's coming from. But now we can take a better look at the rise time and pre-shoot. So let me just get some measurements going here. So let's look at pre-shoot. Yeah, this is saying about 60% pre-shoot. Uh, let's also take a look at the rise time. So we're getting a rise time of about 3.3 microseconds, which is a lot slower than the waveform we're uh, giving it, which is, as we noticed before, about 20 nanoseconds. Uh, so the on time of this chip, I mean, we're talking, you know, almost 40 years later. So at the time, this was pretty good. Um, I'm still interested why we're getting this little pre-shoot, uh, which of course, you know, almost two-thirds of the overall voltage height, um, which is quite interesting. So let's do the same thing, but let's look at the fall time, which of course is not very good. So, look at the fall time here. Yeah, it's giving me about half of what I measured on the other one between, and of course this is 80-20, uh, or 90-10, sorry. So we're getting about a millisecond, 20-80, about 640 microseconds. So that's interesting. Um, again, not a particularly great turn off time, so I guess that was sort of the weakness of this design was that switch off time. Uh, of course, this was really meant as, you know, probably not meant to even be switched this fast. This is being switched at uh, 50 hertz. Um, it was probably meant to be just turned off every now and then to control an analog signal, although who knows? Uh, it'll be interesting to take a quick look in the data sheet and see what they say the maximum switching time is. Interesting, I, I didn't really take that close of a look at this before. Uh, it's saying the turn on time is between 300 to 1000 nanoseconds, and we're actually getting uh, about that, particularly good. And it's saying that the turn off time is even faster at 200 to 425 seconds. Um, and there's not a whole lot, I mean, we're looking at five puff of uh, source during and off capacitance. Um, and they were switching that at 140 kilohertz, I believe, um, which is interesting. Um, so this is interesting. Uh, however, this of course is a slightly newer uh, data sheet for the same chip. So of course these could easily be completely wrong uh, stats. I might try and find an older data sheet. So there you have it guys, that's our follow up on the DG200BP chip from 1977. Uh, fairly impressive on times, um, better than what the, uh, actually now that I think about it, I think I had that wrong, I think our rise times were actually worse than what we were seeing in the data sheet. Oh, 300 to 1000 nanoseconds, yeah that's 3 to 10 microseconds, um, or sorry, 0.3 to 1 microseconds. Uh, so anyway, I'm going to start that over. Three, two, one. Uh, interestingly, this chip, the DG200BP, has switching times that were probably pretty good considering it was 1977. 
I made a little mistake in the last scene. I actually re-looked at the turn on time and so both the turn on and turn off times that we were seeing on the scope were worse than what was in the uh, data sheet. Uh, the turn on time was between 300 and 1000 nanoseconds which of course is between 0.3 and 1 microsecond. I think our on time we are seeing about 3 to 4 microseconds and the off time of course we are seeing almost a millisecond. Uh, which is, you know, almost two orders of magnitude worse than what they're saying in the data sheet. Again, this data sheet we're looking at uh, is for a newer chip. Uh, this could be, this chip might not even have been made with the CMOS process. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I'm going to try and find a more accurate and more uh, period data sheet. Um, but there you go. For those that asked, uh, you wanted to take a look, uh, a follow up at this chip, there you have it. Um, if there's any more questions you want me to, you know, if you have, or if you want me to do other experiments, feel free to put them in the comments below. I'm going to try and do more videos uh, as much as I can now. And actually, now that I'm done filming this one, I'm going to start working on another interesting video. So thanks a lot for watching, guys. If you liked the video, click the thumbs up or like button. And uh, if you're not already subscribed, subscribe. And as usual, blah, 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 me, you know talking on my own channel. Try and get your friends to subscribe if you think they all think it's interesting. Don't spam anyone. I don't want to get a bad name for the channel, of course. But uh, thank you very much for those who watch, for those who leave comments. I love when people leave comments. I like to read them. And of course, I'm always learning something new as well. Anyway, thanks guys, and check in soon for more videos.